Hello everyone, I'm Professor Plink. I respond to various theological and ideological questions and claims from a rationalistic and naturalistic approach in an effort to give and explain the opposite viewpoint and help to balance the conversation. Before we get into today's video, a special shout out to my most recent super thankers, BS Not Accepted, Piao Meow Noir in a waifu car, Camille Dabrowski 2229, Triad Mad, Design Tech DK, and James LaMica. Thank you all very much for your kind support of my channel. You are the skeptical sausage and pragmatic pepperoni on my anti-mysticism meat lovers deep dish. Thank you very much for helping me to continue to do what I do. And if you like what you see in this video and would like to help out the channel, make sure to subscribe and click the bell so you'll always be notified when new content comes out. And of course, liking this video and popping in a comment down in the comment section really does go a long way towards pleasing the YouTube algorithm and keeping my channel chugging along. Now on to today's video. Frank Turk is back again, folks. That's right, the figurehead of Cross Examine Ministries, author of the laughably titled book, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist, and the guy who regularly insists that objective morality exists because all cultures throughout history have always had the exact same moral values. Well, so long as you ignore all the slave driving, human sacrificing, and all the horrible implications of Deuteronomy 22:28. Yeah, he's back again. And this time, he's got four, count them, four reasons why we can know that Christianity is true. Well, you're already off on bad footing, Frank, because we know unequivocally that there are aspects of Christianity that are not true. If the basis for Christianity is the Bible, and it is, there are loads of things in there that we know to be factually in error. Basically, all of Genesis, for instance. The entire creation myth, Adam and Eve, the Garden of Eden, all that nonsense. Proven scientifically to be wrong. And I mean, if we wanted to get pedantic about it, there are things on practically every page of the Bible that have either been found to be incorrect or are contradicted by other verses in other parts of the Bible, putting the Bible at odds with itself. But all of that might be just the fine print, and maybe Frank is really wanting to focus on the big picture here. So let's hear him out as he dives into his four reasons why we can know that Christianity is the truth. Let's have it, Frank. The reason that we believe Christianity is true is because the answer to four questions is yes. All right, sorry to stop it so early, but this is just shoddy video construction, or at least a bad title. This video is literally titled, Four Reasons Why Christianity is True. But in the first five seconds, Frank is pivoting to four questions to ask to prove Christianity is true. Well, questions aren't reasons. Questions are interrogative statements seeking information or clarification. Reasons are explanations or justifications of a position or occurrence. So before he even gets to his questions, He's insisting that the answers to all of these questions are yes, and that makes Christianity true. Well, what if the answer is actually no? Or even, I don't know. Reasons stand on their own. Questions rely on answers to them in order to impart meaning. And those answers require reasons of their own to justify them. So really, this video should have been titled Four Questions That Can Lead You to Christianity Only If the Answers Are All Yes and Those Answers Are Beyond Contestation. But I guess that would have been a little long for a title. So okay then, Frank, what is the first of your four questions that must be answered with an incontrovertible yes? How about the first question, does truth exist? Obviously, you hear people say all the time, there is no truth, or you got your truth, I got my truth, all truth is relative. When somebody says there is no truth, you ought to ask that person a question. You ought to say, is that true? Is it true that there's no truth? Because if it's true that there's no truth, the claim there is no truth can't be true, but it claims to be true. In other words, it's a self-defeating claim. Of course there's truth. If there was no truth, an atheist couldn't be right that there was no God. So there is truth. Oh, you wily little wordsmith, fast-talking so-and-so. 
You really got everyone with that line of thinking, I'll tell you what. No, you have, in a mere 30 seconds, totally put down what is probably the most debated, argued, contested, and fundamentally foundational question in the entire realm of philosophy that even the greatest minds in human history have been kicking around for as long as we've existed on this planet. And Frank Turek totally ended this eternal philosophical debate in less time than it takes to heat up a hot pocket. Or, perhaps he just gave the most pedestrian response to a complex philosophical issue that one could imagine in order to convince the rubes in his audience that objective truth is really, really real, and don't think about it any further than that. But there is a reason this is a thousands of years old topic with no end in sight. I mean, for starters, we need to define terms. So what do we mean by truth? Are we talking about what accurately comports to reality? Are we talking about what can be proven factually correct? Because those are two different things. And if we're talking about what can be proven factually correct, then how does that jive with things that are conceptual, like ideas and perspectives? Because those things cannot be proven factually correct. Like, for instance, is it true that lasagna is the best Italian food of all? Well, if that is some people's opinion, then it's true for them. It certainly isn't false, but it isn't true for those who would disagree. And thus, each person can have their own truth in this way. So then, can we say truth isn't objective? Or then are there different layers of truth, such as truth for individuals, but also the truth of reality, which could be said to be objective? Okay, but even then, you have to get into the idea that we may not have the ability to accurately perceive reality, because our perceptions are limited by our fallible senses, as well as our individualistic perspective. For instance, two people are looking at a red shirt. One of them is colorblind and the other isn't. They're seeing two different things when they look at that shirt. Which perspective is true? Technically, neither is completely in accordance with reality. Because even the viewer who isn't colorblind is still unable to perceive everything about that shirt. There are certain wavelengths of light that the human eye just can't see. Not to mention all the tiny, non-red particles of dirt or flaked off skin cells or any of a million other things that are adhering to the shirt. We simply can't perceive the actuality of reality. So then, can our interpretation of reality ever really be true? Or is it okay to just say it's true enough? Well then, if that's the case, what is true enough? How do we quantify that? Do you see? This isn't a simple question. And you can't just defeat the idea that we cannot access real truth by just asking, in a smarmy and condescending manner, Well, is that true? Mwahaha! <laughs> Frank does this a lot in his talks and his Q&A sessions whenever anyone challenges him by claiming the existence of moral relativism. He insists that there is objective morality as an extension of objective truth, and then when they retort that there isn't definitive objective truth, he responds with, Well, is that true? And then he smiles like a goon while his fans clap like trained seals, without even realizing that he's just hand-waving away centuries of philosophical exploration of this issue without giving it its due consideration. So then, in answer to the first question, does truth exist, the answer would be that it depends on what you mean by truth, and if by truth you mean an objective reality that humans have the ability to perceive and understand, the only logical answer would be, I don't know. And if all four of these questions require a yes in order for Christianity to be true, we've already failed to meet that. So it's not looking good, Frank, but crack on with question number two. Question number two, does God exist? There are several arguments for the existence of God. Let me just give you one. Even atheists today are admitting that space, matter, and time had a beginning out of nothing. 
<laughs> Ahem. The Big Bang was not the creation of the universe out of nothing. It is the expansion of the current presentation of our universe from its initial state of high density and temperature. High density, high temperature, this means energy and the initial building blocks of what would become all the matter of the universe. That is not nothing. No one who understands the most basic aspects of Big Bang cosmology says that the universe came out of nothing. It's the second mother-flipping line in the first paragraph on the Wikipedia page on the Big Bang Theory. It'll be in the first paragraph of any physics textbook or website describing the basics of the Big Bang. Space.com, what is the Big Bang Theory? The universe as we know it started with an infinitely hot and dense single point that inflated and stretched. Britannica.com, Big Bang Model. Its essential feature is the emergence of the universe from a state of extremely high temperature and density. Exploratorium.edu, The Big Bang. The universe began, scientists believe, with every speck of its energy jammed into a very tiny point. This extremely dense point exploded with unimaginable force, creating matter and propelling it outward to make the billions of galaxies of our vast universe. On and on. So what are you talking about, Frank? Where are you getting this notion that everyone, atheists included, agree that the universe was created out of nothing? Please, cite your source. Give one example of a physicist or cosmologist claiming that the universe began out of absolutely nothing. Creation ex nihilo, Frank. Show me the source. You can't because it doesn't exist. There is nothing in the current Big Bang cosmological model that says that there was absolutely nothing, utter non-existence of anything whatsoever, to then go bang, whip, boom, everything sprang into existence out of nothing. That is a thoroughly Christian notion, not a scientific one and not an atheistic one. Flat out, Frank is lying. Well, think about this, friends. If space, matter, and time had a beginning out of nothing, whatever created space, matter, and time can't be made of space, matter, and time. If space, matter, and time... If, 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 well, it's a good thing that isn't what happened then. Now, when you think about a spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, personal, intelligent cause, who do you think of? Where the hell is all the rest of this coming from? All we were dealing with up to this point was the first three, space, time, and matter. So if I were to grant you those three for the sake of the argument, I still don't see how you're jumping to the other three. Powerful? That's an opinion-based classification. It only really matters in comparison to something else. I mean, we are powerful compared to an ant but we're not powerful compared to a supernova. And something does not need to itself be powerful to create something vastly more powerful or bigger than itself. I mean, a spark can cause an explosion that is exponentially greater in power than itself. So when apologists talk then about a creator god being personal, they typically mean that a personal god is a supreme being with self-consciousness and will, capable of feeling, has the attributes and desires of a person, and enters into relationships with individuals and people groups. And this too, I don't see where you're getting this from. Why does the beginnings of the current presentation of our universe in any way suggest a being with personality and self-consciousness was behind it? Same with intelligence. The Big Bang could have, and I would say most likely was, a natural change in state from what the universe existed as before to what the universe exists as today. And if it were a natural change, then there's no will. There's no intelligence. No consciousness behind it. So I feel like you're just pulling those last three things right out of your derriere. 
So while there are many, many arguments that apologists and theists of all stripes attempt to make for the existence of God, you went with this one, basically a version of the cosmological argument. You built it on a faulty premise that was an outright lie about the Big Bang coming from nothing, presumed a creator-god cause that did not follow from that premise, and then attempted to shoehorn in a bunch of aspects of that creator-god cause that were based on nothing. So, in answer to your question of, is there a god, and based solely on the lousy argument that you just made, the answer would have to be no. It's more likely that the Big Bang was a natural occurrence. The third question is, are miracles possible? No. A miracle, defined as a surprising and welcomed event that is not explicable by natural or scientific laws and is therefore considered to be the work of a divine agency, is not possible. Everything that happens or has ever happened has been explainable by natural means, whether or not people at the time had the knowledge or data to properly do that. But go ahead, Frank, prove me wrong. Obviously, Christianity can't be true if miracles are not possible. But the greatest miracle in the Bible has already occurred, and we have scientific evidence for it. What's that? I just mentioned it. The creation of the universe out of nothing. No. No. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. No. 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 Hell no. 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 I refuse. No. No. You didn't get away with building your last point on that complete lie. You sure as crap aren't going to get away with doing it this time either. Put out another miracle or shut up about it. He can resurrect Jesus from the dead or walk on water or part the Red Sea. He can do any of that. The resurrection and the walking on water thing were both supposed singular events that have no evidence behind them other than being attested to in the Bible itself. And as far as being claimed in the Bible goes, well... As for the Red Sea being parted, though explanations of a natural occurrence parting the Red Seas have been proposed, such as a volcanic eruption or an earthquake causing a land bridge to arise, none of it really matters anyway, as archaeologists who live and work in the area have stated that there is no archaeological evidence to support the biblical account of the Red Sea parting. So, as for question three, are miracles possible? Based on your examples, a lie about the universe coming from nothing as your primary one, and then quick-fired claims of a resurrected Jesus who walked on water and parted the Red Sea, none of which have ever been proven to have actually happened, based on those examples, the answer would be probably not. Those supposed miracles probably did not happen. The best you could get for this question of, are miracles even possible, is an I don't know. But certainly you can't get a yes out of that one. Moving on. So the final question, the fourth question, which gets us all the way to the Christian God is, is the New Testament reliable enough to show us that Jesus rose from the dead? The reason we believe in Christianity is because an event occurred, the resurrection. Now, I have to ask you this, why would the Jewish writers of the New Testament, all were Jewish with the exception of Luke, why would they invent a resurrected Jesus? All the writers of the New Testament except for Luke were Jewish? Don't tell that to Paul, who supposedly wrote 13 of the 27 books of the New Testament well after he became a Christian. And of the rest, if you believe the traditionalist position on the authorship of the Bible, Another nine books of the New Testament were written by the four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all of whom were followers of Jesus. Also, there were supposed authors of other books in the New Testament, like Peter, one of the twelve apostles, and James, who was Jesus' brother. You don't think devoted followers and literal family of Jesus might have had a vested interest in proliferating the story and fame of the faith and the faith leader that they all followed with embellished or totally fabricated stories of that leader's miraculous deeds? 
And of course, all of this is if you even accept the idea that the books of the New Testament were actually authored by those the church claims wrote them, which is a matter of much disagreement. It's possible we don't know who many of the authors were. Why would they say that a man who claimed to be God rose from the dead if it didn't happen? They thought that would be blasphemy for a man to claim to be God. And why would they invent a resurrected Jesus? They already thought they were God's chosen people. They had no motive to invent a resurrected Jesus. Which supposed author of the New Testament do you claim was actually Jewish and not a follower of and believer in Jesus, Frank? Seriously, there isn't even one. Look here. The books and the claimed authors. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Luke, Paul, unknown, James, Peter, John, Jude, John, Christian after Christian, apostles, followers of Jesus one and all. Who on this list was of the Jewish faith and didn't believe in the teachings of Jesus? Name me one. It's not there. And certainly they could not have invented it in Jerusalem where an empty tomb existed. Ah, sweet zombie Jesus. The empty tomb. Again, something that is only attested to in the Bible with no corroborating evidence. Because, I mean, how could there be? We know of locations where dead bodies were entombed back then, mass burial sites for those executed as criminals and such, and when we don't find any 2,000-year-old remains that we conclude to have belonged to Jesus, well, lo and behold, that must prove he resurrected, right? No. As Carl Sagan said, the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. Not finding Jesus in a tomb is not evidence that he rose from the dead any more than if you exhumed your great-grandmother's coffin and there was no body in it, that doesn't mean she's a zombie walking the earth looking for brains to devour. Not to mention that some of the most often referenced contradictions in the Bible are differing accounts of the resurrection story. Three women went to the tomb and found it empty. No, wait, there were only two women who did that who were then so scared that they told no one. No, wait, they went back and they told the apostles that they couldn't find Jesus in his tomb. No, wait, they told them that they actually saw the risen Jesus and he spoke to them, etc. All of the Gospels contradict each other on the resurrection story. And if the single, non-scholarly, totally uncorroborated, potentially fallaciously attributed authorship source can't even agree with itself about what happened, then why should anyone else beyond the sycophantic devotees take it even the slightest bit seriously? So then, to question four, which was, is the New Testament reliable enough to show us that Jesus arose from the dead? A resounding, unequivocal, and definitive no to that one. There's no agreement as to who actually wrote the New Testament, even if we accept the biased claims of Christians about who authored them, they were all devoted Christians and followers of Jesus who would have had a vested interest in lying in order to further spread the faith that they devoted their lives to. The Bible itself contradicts itself on every other page about the resurrection story. And in light of how monumentally wrong multiple other parts of the Bible have been proven to be, it throws the validity of the entire source in its entirety into question, at least to the level where anything in it is going to require corroboration by independent sources before anyone could be expected to take anything the Bible has to say seriously. There is simply no good reason to accept the New Testament's account of the resurrection story and every reason to be immensely skeptical of it. So a resounding no to the question of the New Testament's reliability. So there are our four questions, all of which required a yes for each and every one of them in order to conclude that Christianity is true. And to recap, question one, does truth exist? At best, we don't know. Philosophy has been kicking around that question for millennia, and you, Frank, did not bust that one wide open in 30 seconds. Question two, does God exist? At best, 
We don't know. But your attempt to prove that he did utilized a complete misrepresentation and an outright lie about what the Big Bang Theory says. So based on your fallacious argument, no, God is not likely to exist. Question 3. Are miracles possible? At best, we don't know. But you went back to the lie about the Big Bang, and your other miracle examples are dubious, claimed only in the Bible, which is not a reliable source. And since the Big Bang was definitely not a miracle, and since miracles require a divinity to cause them, and we already answered no to the God question in question two, no, miracles are not possible. And question four, is the New Testament reliable enough to show us that Jesus arose from the dead? Absolutely, positively not. So you needed all four to be answered yes in order to make your case, Frank, and you couldn't even manage to get one. This was some real shoddy apologetics, buddy. I'd say you need to do better, but being fairly familiar with your arguments and strategies, I'm pretty well convinced that this is about the best you can do. And so that is where we'll leave things for today. So thanks for watching, everyone. Don't forget to like this video, comment, and subscribe so you'll always be notified when a new video comes out. Until next time, I'm Professor Plink reminding you to keep striving for greater understanding. It's the best way to get wherever you want to go.